Hello and welcome. This is Curious Robin. In 1959, a journalist named Frank Herbert was doing research for an article on the Oregon dunes. At that moment, he not only became fascinated with ecology and its systems, but this event also planted the seed in his mind that would become the novel known as Dune, published in 1965. Herbert's book tells the story of a feudal interstellar civilization ruled by an emperor, a society where different noble houses confront each other for control and power under his rule. The tale focuses on House Atreides, a powerful family sent by the Emperor to oversee operations in a desert planet called Arrakis, also known as Dune. This planet is crucial to the Empire, as it is the only place that produces a spike-like substance known as Melange, which is basically a drug that greatly enhances mind and body. It is the most coveted substance in the universe and is the basis for most technological advances in this society. House Atreides consists of Duke Leto, the house's leader, Lady Jessica, Leto's partner and a member of a powerful sisterhood, and Paul, their son and heir to House Atreides. He is also the protagonist of the novel. This family will have to survive the trials encountered in Arrakis, which include armed conflicts, betrayal, assassination attempts, and 400 meter long sandworms that lurk beneath the sands of the desert planet. This novel, which not only spawned a huge following, but was also succeeded by an expanding universe of sequels and prequels, and is cited as the world's best-selling science fiction novel. It also inspired some other stories you may know. One of the most celebrated aspects of Dune is its themes, which include ecology, politics, religion, technology, heroism, and the way all of these are connected and influence each other. These themes are sewn together in a world building of huge scope. Every faction, societal norm or technological advance in the novel has an extended backstory that is revealed bit by bit as the narrative progresses. You have House Atreides, a noble family that originated in Greece, when Earth was an inhabitable planet thousands of years ago. The Atreides rose to power during the war against the thinking machines and later settled in the planet of Caladan, where they House Harkonnen, another noble family led by the infamous Baron Vladimir Harkonnen. This family has been in a feud with the Atreides for years. Their rule is notorious for using sinister tactics and favoring industrialization. They are conspiring to take control of House Corino, the most powerful among the great houses, as this family is led by Shaddam IV, the emperor of the known universe, also called the Imperium. This house has ruled for thousands of years as it the Bene Gesserit, a powerful religious group that has manipulated and influenced humanity from the shadows for thousands of years. It is comprised of a sisterhood that has acquired supernatural mental and physical abilities that help them guide humankind to a path of enlightenment. Their members also use the Fremen, the native inhabitants of Arrakis, the Spacing Guild, an institution that has a monopoly on space travel, the Mentats, human computers who assist the great houses, and so on, and so on. All of this helps construct a complex and credible universe filled with fascinating characters and stories that are covered in Dune and the many books that follow it, spanning a history of about 15,000 years in total, with the original 1965 novel right in the middle of this extensive timeline. The Dune universe is so vast and detailed that reprints of the original novel include an extensive appendix, and an encyclopedia explaining further lore was also written by Herbert himself. One of my favorite aspects in the original book and its direct sequels is found in its original themes and is better explained by the author, as he said. The problem with leadership is that leaders are human beings, and when they make mistakes, their mistakes are amplified by the numbers who follow without question. And that's why I say think for yourself, ask questions. Since its publication in 1965, Dune has walked a difficult path when it comes to being adapted. In the 70s, it went through a production so filled with problems it has become the stuff of legend. In the 80s, it was finally brought to the big screen with the direction of David Lynch, but due to the accumulated problems from the previous production, plus additional ones, the result, well, it divides audiences to this day. I'm sorry, Gurney. Not sorry enough. <laughs> The 
Then, there were two actually decent miniseries in the early 2000s, but it wouldn't be until 2020, oh sorry, 2021, where we would see another attempt at turning the celebrated novel into a feature film. While Dion was on this path, there was a particular man walking his own, a French-Canadian filmmaker named Denis Villeneuve, and he may not have known it yet, but his trajectory was going to eventually collide with one of science fiction's most famous novels. One of the most anticipated films of the year, Dune was released on 2021. The script was written by Villeneuve himself, John Spates and Eric Roth. Due to the director's filmography and the popularity of the source material, the expectations were huge. In this case, context is vital. Audiences are coming out of a global pandemic, and some are returning to the cinema after a year-long absence. We were promised other films would break the dry spell of not only box office success, but also of audience expectations and satisfaction, as production companies are still adapting to the new models of distribution. Things are… different now. For example, Ridley Scott made an excellent medieval film with some of the most famous actors right now, and it was a flop. things are really becoming more and more unpredictable. So, what about Dune? Well, Dune is actually very good. Yeah, yeah, I know. Thank you, everyone. Let's just stop the video here. Very smartly, Villeneuve pushed the film to be split into two parts, or maybe a trilogy. And it's no surprise the filmmaker chose to dedicate two films instead of one to adapt a 500-page book. About this, the director said, I would not agree to make this adaptation of the book with one single movie. The world is too complex. It's a world that takes its power in details. And details this movie is filled with, both technical and narrative. This two and a half hour adaptation follows the Atreides family as they try to survive the hostile planet of Arrakis. As a conspiracy for their demise is set in motion by the Emperor and the Harkonnen house. Similar to what he did in Blade Runner 2049, the Canadian filmmaker assembled a team of people that really pushed the boundaries of what can be achieved visually in modern cinema. The film presents an intergalactic society that works, just as in the book, in a feudal-like manner, accompanied by religious undertones that emphasize importance on power and honor. The sets and production design show glimpses of different cultures, history and myths. The wardrobe helps us distinguish between the different professions and groups that exist in the world of Frank Herbert's novel. The cinematography builds an atmosphere that often shows an aesthetic reality that could very well be situated in our own universe, while at other times it presents a menacing and dark world that hides something in the shadows. The different locations of the film are distinguished by distinct monochromatic looks, and the overall story finds a balance between panoramic landscapes and intimate close-ups of the characters and their relationships. The resulting shots look like paintings out of a museum. Always makes me feel a little melancholy. This and some very nice CGI design come together to create a world that is immense in every way. Not only are the mythical sandworms found in unimaginable sizes, but the same man-made structures and technology constantly remind us how small are the people that created them. All visuals are joined by an excellent sound design and musical score that mix together as they become different themes, from loud overwhelming music to the quiet, almost unnerving moments of silence that usually prelude the violence to come. The movie finds time for small moments that show how the characters care for each other. 
making them relatable and building a relationship between them and the audience. The dangers of living in the desert planet become more relevant and menacing. All these elements are helmed by the expertise of Villeneuve, who manages to bring some of his directing trademarks to this adaptation. The story manages to include a significant amount of information without relying so much on exposition. The several groups and intentions of each character are given enough time on screen to make the choices and interactions between them and their situation believable and coherent. It's in a box. Pain. The novel is a marvel to get immersed in, but its overwhelming scope doesn't make it very accessible. So having created such an entertaining and overall attractive film, is already quite an achievement. For me, this is the aspect that should be the most praised, as the main issue that has always been present with any adaptation of Dune is that the information found in the book is just so massive it always becomes overwhelming for the screenwriters and filmmakers. All of this being said, the film suffers from a few problems. Since it covers only the first half of the book, it ends up feeling just like that. It leaves the audience without closure. And for any kind of story, closure is extremely important. Even in serialized fiction, it is essential to present a clear ending for most aspects of the story in any book or film, while you can leave room for continuation for a bigger, more important story arc. Narrative closure is identified as a phenomenological feeling of finality that is generated when all the questions silently posed by the narrative are answered. There's a clear emotional climax in the film, but after this happens, the story continues for an additional 30 or 40 minutes. It's almost as if the movie finished but no one told it it had ended. So the pacing suffers greatly because of this, and in the real ending, the one before the credits roll, the movie finishes in a somewhat anticlimactic way and just cuts to black. Cinematographer Greg Fraser said in an interview, It's a fully formed story in itself, with places to go. It's a fully standalone epic film that people will get a lot out of when they No, it's not. You're one of my favorite cinematographers. But don't lie. Ow! Shoo! 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 The casting and performing of most of the cast is truly commendable. The characters have notable differences as they bring distinct personalities and attributes to the story, including the charismatic Jason Momoa as Duncan Idaho, Stellan Skarsgård as a truly unsettling Baron Harkonnen, Oscar Isaac as the Honorable Duke Leto, and Rebecca Ferguson as a passionate and badass Lady Jessica. All of this makes it even more confusing as to why the main character, played by Timothée Chalamet, looks so bored and lifeless most of the time. He looks bored in the poster. He looks bored when visiting his ancestors' burial site. He even looks bored when he's fighting. Is Arrakis boring you, Timothée? Is Sam boring you? Is Zendaya boring you? Do something. In big blockbuster films, there's always the danger of having a spectacle overshadowed story, and in the case of Dune, this also threatens the quality of the film. But as much as the spectacle in this movie really stands out, Villeneuve manages to maintain focus on the characters that give the story life, and as a result, you can only stare in awe. Quoting Herbert himself, People are the true strength of a great house, Paul thought, and he remembered how Watts' words, Parting with people is a sadness. A place is only a place. We must not forget that this movie was a bet, made by one of the most passionate commercial directors working in Hollywood today, an enormous production that really shows that people behind its realization truly cared about it. I like to believe that if Frank Herbert was alive today, he would be proud of this adaptation. 
his complex work recreated with vision. His literary prose turned into a cinematic experience that insists to be witnessed in the big screen. A combination of a sense of wonder and distinct storytelling that is not seen very often. And isn't that what cinemas are all about? I'm Curious Robin, until we meet again. If you like the content, consider subscribing to the channel.